Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This is part number two of a six-part series on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. This morning we'll be answering uh, some of these questions concerning divorce. What does the Bible mean when it speaks of divorce? Does God allow divorce? If God allows divorce, what's the purpose in that allowance? And finally, does God allow remarriage following divorce? We're going to be trying to cover all these subjects very quickly this morning. So we'll need all the time we possibly can here on this YouTube channel. So very quickly, let me just say once again, I have a free electronic book out there, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. I believe it would be a benefit to you as we go down through these lessons for you to follow in the book. So if you go to www.settledinheaven.wordpress.com, that's www.settledinheaven, that's one word, .wordpress.com, you'll go to my blog. Once you're at my blog, you can look, there's tabs at the top of the blog. If you go to the tab that says Books Available, click on that tab, you'll find a book, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. It's in both Microsoft Word format and PDF format. Uh, you're welcome to download for free, whichever format works best for you. That way you'll have a set of notes in front of you as we go down through these things. I, I believe they will help you because my notes or my book has much more information on this subject than what I can cover in YouTube. So I'm going over just the main points that, that you find in each chapter. But I'll tell you what, folks, there's more information, there's more references, there's more details than what I can begin to cover. So hopefully it'll help you in that way. But also, let me just encourage you to please study these things on your own. Folks, there's many different views about marriage, divorce, and remarriage out there. And I'll tell you, there are differing views that are held by many really good people that love the Lord, that are trying the best they can to teach God's Word. So it's important that each one of us comes to an understanding of this subject on our own. There's no reason to simply accept what someone else teaches about it and just say, well, that's what I believe. We all need, as Christians, we all need to take time to study these things on our own. Remember, once we were saved, the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit. And now that the Holy Spirit is indwelling us, we have the ability to understand God's Word on our own. So as we hear teachings from whoever, whether it's me or someone else, be sure to check what I'm saying or what the other teacher is saying with what God's Word says. Because really, folks, the only thing that's important is what God's Word says. I'm only human. I'm the first to admit I can make mistakes understanding God's Word because I still have a sin nature within me. Likewise, any other teacher that you've ever heard teach on this subject, it's possible they are making an honest, legitimate mistake because they still have their sin nature where they believe what they're saying is the truth, but they're in error. It's even possible for some people to twist these things and on purpose teach error. In either case, it's our responsibility to come to an understanding of God's word for ourselves. So I would ask you to please, if you get a copy of my notes, a copy of my book, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage, it'll have all the major verses in the Bible that address this subject, or at least most of them. That'll help to give you an outline for your own studies. You'll be able to know which verses you need to especially <clears throat> concentrate on to come to an understanding of this important and this difficult subject. Let's get into our lesson for this morning. This morning we're looking at the idea of divorce and remarriage. Does the Lord ever allow divorce? And if so, under what uh, situation does he allow them? Now for this morning's lesson, I think it's the easiest to cover these things by simply asking a question and then giving you verses that give the answer. Okay, and you'll understand as we go further in this how we're going to do this. The first question I would like us to ask is this. What does the Bible mean when it speaks of divorce? When the Bible talks about divorce, what does that mean? Well, the easiest way I know of to understand what the, the, the idea of divorce means is by looking at the different uh, titles that divorce is given. As we go further in this, you'll understand what we're doing. For example, divorce in the Bible is described as divorcement in some verses. 
The idea of divorcement, if you study what the original word is that, that we get divorcement from, or the original words, there's an Old Testament word and a New Testament word translated divorce. If you study what those words mean, basically they mean to cut off something, to destroy something, or to remove something. So when the Bible talks about divorce, the basic idea is this. Divorce is the act of destroying or removing the marital agreement. It's as if two people come together in agreement. They come together in a covenant. That's what binds them together where you have two individuals as one unit. And when the Bible talks about divorce, it means it abolishes that covenant. It destroys that covenant. It removes that covenant where it's no longer in effect. That's what the Bible means by the term divorcement. There's another term the Bible uses to mean divorce. It's to put away someone. Again, if you study what the idea of put away means, it's the idea to send somebody away, to lay somebody off to the side, to release somebody, to leave someone. Those are all ideas behind the phrase to put away. What that's teaching us about divorce is when a person or when two people are divorced, it is relieving those people of the obligation of that covenant. It's the idea, it's withdrawing the covenant. It's sending the covenant away. It's undoing the covenant. It's laying the covenant off to the side. So the basic idea of to put away when it talks about divorce is saying the people that made this agreement, they're no longer going to be under the bond, bond, uh, bondage of it. They're no longer going to be under the restraints of that agreement. It's now been laid off to the side. It's now been put up. It's been put away. <clears throat> Excuse me, another term for divorce used in the Bible is to put asunder or to sunder the marriage covenant. The idea of sundering means to pull apart and to place space in between. Now remember when we talked about marriage, we said it's two individuals being bound together where you have the individuals existing, but they are now tied together so they're like one unit. The idea of to put asunder means you're dividing those individuals up and putting space in between them. They're no longer bound to one another. This teaches us that, that the idea of divorce is destroying the relationship that once existed. Before they had a relationship where they were bound together intimately. They were like one unit. When the Bible says divorce means to put asunder, it means you're separating these people and putting space in between them now. They're no longer looked at as one unit. They're now looked on as two separate individuals only. That's what it means to divorce someone. Finally, the fourth term the Bible uses over and over again for divorce is to send out. The idea of send out means, again, just what it says, to send somebody away, to send somebody out, to push them away, to depart from someone. All of those are ideas behind to send out. What's that teach us about divorce? It is an act of one person pushing the other away. Or, in the case of where a divorce is agreed upon, it's each person pushing each other away. But in either case, it's the idea of pushing the person away. Those who were bound together, who should be loving to one another, and who should want to have the other person in their life at all times, they're now saying, I don't want you. I'm pushing you away. Sometimes, folks, that can happen for good reason. You can have somebody who's abused in a relationship, who's mistreated, they say, look, i got to get away. That's not necessarily a sinful attitude when a person is being abused, when a person is mistreated. So I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. My only point is it is a person pushing someone else away saying, I no longer want to be joined together with you. I need to have separation from you. That is, again, a word for divorce. So those four terms, divorcement, to put away, to put asunder, and to send out. You're going to see those used in the Bible at different times to describe a divorce. 
In each case, they're describing the same thing. It's a divorce, but they're describing different aspects of that divorce. Okay, let's ask another question. Does God ever allow divorce? Okay, in Deuteronomy 24, we find that the Lord says he allows divorce in the case of losing favor. Now listen to what's said. When a man hath taken his wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife. Okay, let's answer first of all. Does the Lord allow divorce? Right here we are told in the Old Testament that a man who no longer, or a man who had a wife who no longer had found favor in his sight, he is said that let him write her a bill of divorcement, give it into her hand, and send her out of his house. What's that say? Divorce is allowed. Now, whether the action that, in, that motivated the divorce is sinful or not is not our point right now. We'll look at this in detail as we look at the grounds for a divorce. I just want you to see the fact remains. Moses gave allowance in certain situations for a divorce to take place. Let me tell you one more thing. Back in the days of Moses, a divorce, I'm sorry, back in the days of Moses, the act of adultery, where you had a husband and a wife, the husband had relations with another woman, or the wife had relations with another man. The act of adultery, the physical act of uh, sexual adultery, that was punishable by death, by stoning. So whatever is involved in Deuteronomy 24 here, it's not adultery. Whatever the uncleanness is that this guy sees in his wife that causes her no longer have favor in his sight can't be adultery. Here's why. If it was adultery, they wouldn't be talking about divorce. They would simply stone that person and the other person would automatically be freed from the marital covenant because their spouse would have died due to the adultery they committed because there was a death penalty against adulterers. So whatever this uncleanness is, and again, we'll get into that maybe a little bit later in the future lesson, but whatever the uncleanness is, I just want you to understand, we're not talking about adultery here concerning grounds for divorce. We're talking something else. And whatever it was, the uncleanness that he saw and heard, the point is he, found he lost favor. She lost favor in his sight. In other words, he became hard-hearted toward her. He was no longer gracious toward her. He was no longer forgiving toward her. Whatever it was that he saw in her life he didn't like, it turned him from her. Where he now is turned against her, whether rightfully or wrongfully. And again, I guess that would involve what the uncleanness is. But the point is, he was turned against his wife. And Moses said, look, when that happens, when she loses favor to the point you're now hard-hearted against her, the divorce can be written. Now it goes on. When she is departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife. Okay, so now here we can see remarriage is allowed in the Old Testament. When she is departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband does what? Hate her and write her a bill of divorcement, give it into her hands, send it out of the house. Or if the latter husband died, which took her to be his wife, then it goes on to say she can't remarry the first husband. The point is this. In the first instance, this woman's first marriage, a divorce was allowed when the man had lost, or when she had lost favor in the man's sight. In other words, he turned against her, was no longer gracious toward her. She no longer was pleasing to him. He got to the point he was hard-hearted and unforgiving. The divorce could be had. Okay, she goes out, she marries a second guy. Then we're told if that second husband gets to the point he hates her, which I equate to mean basically the same thing as losing favor in his sight. When the second husband hates her, notice, once again, the divorce is allowed. He hates her, he gives her a bill of divorcement, and she is free again. Now the problem then comes in, okay, now that she's free, she's not allowed to go back to be with the first husband. 
We'll get into all that in a later lesson, but my point here is this. In both cases, in Deuteronomy 24, we can see, yes, a divorce was allowed. No, it wasn't because of adultery. It was something else. And it involved, in the first husband's case, her losing favor in his sight. And I, again, another term for that, I believe, is being hard-hearted. In the second instance, her second husband hates her, which again, I equate to being hard-hearted. He's allowed to divorce. They're allowed to have a divorce between them, let's put it that way. So to answer the question, does the Lord allow divorce? In Deuteronomy 24, in the Old Testament, he does. But what about the New Testament? In Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 27 through 32. Ye have heard that it was said of the old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. Talking about the seriousness of facing divine judgment. And the idea is we're supposed to do whatever we have to do. We're to give up whatever we have to give up. We're to take whatever measures necessary to escape facing divine judgment in the last days, which makes sense. It hath been said, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Okay, that's referring back to Deuteronomy 24. But I say unto you that whoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery, and whoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Again, we'll look at all that in detail later, but the point I want you to see is this. Is divorce allowed? In Matthew 5, we're told, yes, it is. In this case, it's for the cause of fornication. What is fornication? We're going to see in a future lesson. I think probably the next lesson we'll be looking at these verses. Fornication is what? I believe, and you'll see why in the next lesson, I believe fornication is when a person follows his selfish desires, his selfish lusts, and in doing so, he forsakes the responsibilities of the marriage covenant he's taken upon himself. Let me say that again. You have the man, he's responsible to the wife to, to uh, keep the marriage covenant. The wife is responsible to the husband for keeping the marriage covenant. You have the husband walking away from that covenant saying, I'm not going to do what that covenant tells me to do anymore. I'm going to break my promises that I gave to you. And he's doing it because he's following the desires of his flesh. Fornication can happen in a lot of different ways. It could be a, you know, intimate, sexual type of thing. But it's more than that. There's many times that husbands turn their backs on their wives, for example, and turn their backs on the marital covenant covenants for other reasons than just that. Sometimes just out of just total selfishness. They just want to be on their own. They just want to get away from it all, whatever. But the point is, and we'll get into fornication next time again and why I believe that's what it's talking about. But for now, the point is, is divorce allowed? Yes. Based on Matthew chapter 5, it is based on the cause of fornication. But at least we know divorce is allowed. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 16. The Apostle Paul has something to say about divorce. In 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 16. <clears throat> Listen to what's said. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Okay, so a wife should not divorce her husband. But if she depart, she can, even though she shouldn't, it is possible to do it. If she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So again, Paul says, marriage should be permanent, but by nature it's not permanent. By nature it can be broken. It's not like it's a permanent thing that just can't be broken no matter what they do. No, the woman can depart from her husband. The husband can depart from his wife, but they shouldn't do it. If they both are doing what's right, if they both are keeping 
the covenant like they should, there would be no need for a divorce. But the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now you are holy. I believe we'll cover this in lesson number four, or lesson five, one or the other. We'll be covering these verses. But if the unbelieving depart, here it is. If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. What's that saying? Is divorce allowed? 1 Corinthians 7, absolutely it is. This time it's in the case of an unbelieving spouse departing from a believing spouse. Again, if you study the word depart, we're going to see the idea of departing is the idea. Not necessarily to physically depart, but it's to depart from the marital agreement, to turn your back on the marital agreement, to walk away from the marital agreement, to put it off to the side and say, I'm not going to keep it anymore. Folks, two people can live under the same roof and yet still depart from the marriage covenant. You can have a husband and a wife living under the same roof, but if the husband refuses to keep the marital covenant, he's departed from it. And yet he can still live under the same roof. Sometimes we think departure has to mean he has to move out and you know move into a hotel or a house or something for him to depart. No. To depart from a marital covenant is to do just that. To depart, to walk away from the covenant although you're still living under the same roof. How many marriages do you know and how many marriages do I know where you have couples living in that situation right now? One or both no longer keep the promises they made, but they're still living under the same roof. And they say, we're married. They say, oh yeah, we're a married couple. Yeah, we're bound by the covenant. But neither one or one or the other chooses no longer to keep that covenant. They've walked away. They've departed from the covenant, even though they're still living together. Does divorce exist? Absolutely. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, look, when you have a lost person walking away from his responsibilities in a marriage, or her responsibilities in a marriage, what do you have? The other one now is free. They're no longer under bondage. Folks, remember, marriage is truly like a contract. It truly is. If I went to an auto dealer and signed a contract saying, I'm going to make $300 payments a month to you in exchange for a new car. Okay? If I sign that contract and you know how they keep the car one day to clean it up and off, they say, well, we're going to clean it up. We'll have it ready for you tomorrow. So I sign the contract so I walk away. That's a Monday. Tuesday, I go back to the auto dealer and I say, okay, I'm ready to pick up my car. They don't give me the car. They don't keep their part of the marital covenant or they don't keep their part of the auto covenant. Am I still obligated to pay them $300 a month when I don't get the car? Absolutely not. A part of the very nature of a covenant or a contract or an agreement is you have two parties agreeing to do things for one another. When one party refuses to do what's right, the other party is no longer under obligation. That's how it works. Would the Lord be displeased with me then, getting back to this auto thing, is the Lord displeased with me if I don't uh, pay that 300 a month? Because remember, I promised them I would. Am I breaking my promise? Not really, because the context of the promise was, Al, I promise you to pay you 300 if you give me the car. I truly believe that's what a marital covenant is. Nobody makes a marital covenant saying, look, I'm going to love you. I don't expect you to love me back. I'm going to take care of you, but you know what? I expect you to beat on me every day. Nobody makes that kind of an agreement when they're married. Not that I know of. Folks, that's why it's important to understand what Paul is saying here. He's saying, look, when one person departs from the covenant, in this case it's an unbeliever. Why? I'll tell you, if a person is a true believer who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, it is tough for a true believer to turn around and walk away from their marital covenant. 
If they're a true believer, if they have the love of the Lord in their heart, how can they turn their back on their spouse? So it's kind of assumed thing that, look, when you have somebody that can just walk away from the marital covenant when they promise their spouse and they can just walk away from that, it's kind of an assumed thing that say their heart's not right with the Lord one way or the other. And in many cases, it's because they're really lost. Again, we'll get into all that when we look at this verse. You'll see how we can use church discipline to help us discern whether the person is saved or lost as we go through these as they go through this type of a situation. But my point is this, just to answer the question, is divorce allowed? Absolutely. In 1 Corinthians 7 it says, this person is no longer under bondage. That's describing some type of divorce where the marital covenant now is dissolved. They're no longer under bondage when somebody else walks away from it. Again, we'll get into more details in future lessons. Not one last question, or two last questions. What is God's purpose in allowing divorce? Okay, if God wants a marriage to be permanent, but if he still allows divorce, it doesn't make sense. Why would he allow divorce when he wants it to be permanent? Matthew 19, uh, verses 3 through 9. <clears throat> the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away or divorce his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? That which he made at the beginning made them male and female. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. Remember, they're two individuals. Now they're joined together as one unit. For God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Folks, let me tell you, I want to make this plain one more time, and I'll try to say this every lesson. God desires for a marriage to be permanent. He does. He desires that. When a marriage is no longer permanent, when a marriage is dissolved through divorce, God is not pleased. Because he had meant for that marriage to be permanent. But he does allow divorces to take place to protect the innocent. Watch what's said. Let not man put asunder, verse 7, then they say unto him, and this is the obvious question to ask, then why then did Moses give command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? They said, okay, if God doesn't intend for marriages to dissolve, if he wants them to be permanent, why did he ever allow divorce? Why did Moses say divorce is okay? Well, first, they must understand what Moses said. Notice he said, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorce? He never commanded it. He just said it would be allowed. They say unto him, okay, verse 8, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered or allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Why is it? Hardness of heart. He said, look, the whole reason why divorce is what divorce is, is because of people's hard hearts. Why is fornication committed? And he gets into the fact that fornication then is a grounds that's allowable in divorce. Why do people commit fornication? They have hardened hearts. Why do people, as we just saw in 1 Corinthians 7, why do they depart from a marital covenant? They have a hardened heart. Why did the people in Malachi chapter 2 deal treacherously with their wives? They had a hardened heart. The Lord said the whole reason behind why he allows divorce, even though he doesn't desire it or command it, he allows it, it's because people's hearts are hardened. When they get hardened, they will abuse their spouse. They will mistreat their spouse. Whether physically, whether emotionally, whether spiritually, they're going to hurt their spouse. If, if people harden their hearts towards someone else, and if a person hates someone else, folks, they're not going to treat the other person right. They're not. I've never yet seen it happen once. When a marriage gets to the point the spouse literally hates the other spouse, they do not do them right. They abuse them and they mistreat them. And they at times use the marital bonds against them then to force them to have continued abuse. Because, oh, we're married. The Lord never intended it to be that way. The Lord wants peace. 
So because a person's heart is hardened, what does he do? He allows divorce to protect the innocent one, to protect from abuse and mistreatment. So why does he allow divorce? Because people's hearts are hard, because of sin, because of hatred. Does God allow remarriage following divorce? Okay, if you remember Deuteronomy 24, we saw absolutely he does in that case. Remember it said the husband was to be sure when he put away his wife to give her a bill of divorcement that would prove she's divorced, allowing her to remarry because she was the innocent one in this case, or probably she was the innocent one in this case. He's trying to protect her and trying to allow her to have, to find someone else that she can marry to be taken care of. In Matthew 5, but I say unto you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. This is Matthew 5, 28-32. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. For it hath been said, Whoever shall put away his wife... Let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, whoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause her to commit adultery. Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Okay, again, the idea of give her a writing of divorcement is brought up again. And the Lord does not, listen to this, the Lord does not speak against that part of what he's saying. The implication is, yeah, they are still to be sure that the person has a writing of divorcement. Proof that they've been divorced. So that they can be remarried. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, remember, that once a spouse departs, the other spouse is no longer under bondage. What's that mean? I believe it means they're no longer under the responsibilities of the marital covenant. What's that imply then? They can be remarried. So, does the Lord allow remarriage after divorce? At least in some cases. And again, we'll, we'll get into that in more detail under the section on remarriage. <clears throat> Folks, I've tried to just cover some of the basic questions we'll be looking at in much more detail in the lessons to come. What is divorce? Why does the Lord allow it? Or is it allowed? Why does he allow it? Is remarriage allowed? I've tried to look at some of these this morning just to give us a basic background as to what we'll be looking at in the lessons to come. Again, if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to make those on my blog. Uh, each of these lessons I'm going over now here on YouTube, I have posted on my blog. You're welcome to make comments and statements about those on my blog. It just helps me to have just one place to go to to deal with all of the input I get from the people watching the YouTube and reading my blog entries instead of having to go back and forth trying to answer many different places. So if you would just go to my blog, www.settledinheaven.wordpress.com, you'll find there you can leave any comment that you would like, and I'll answer it as soon as I can. If you would like to email me with a question or making a more personal comment that you don't want everybody to read, you're welcome to do that. Just email me at settledinheaven at gmail.com. You're welcome to contact me in either way. Uh, also, you can on Facebook. You can contact me as well. Twitter. My only thing with Twitter is I don't check that account a whole lot. So you may have to wait for a response, but I will get to you. It would just be a delayed response on Twitter. <clears throat> but in any case, my point is this, folks. Any comments, I'm, I'm welcome to try to answer for you. Any questions, I'm welcome to answer. But if you would hold on and kind of hear the rest of the lessons, I think that will clarify probably a lot of questions you have in your mind right now because my guess is you probably do have a lot of questions in your mind. But if you just follow through with the rest of the lessons first, I think a lot of those questions may be answered by the time we get done with the series. Thank you again, folks, for giving me your time to graciously... Give me this time to be able to share what I believe the Bible teaches on this subject. Again, I would ask, please, study the Word of God on your own and come to your own conclusions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. May the Lord bless you as you study His Word.